This is the Evergreen Empire. Green grow the forests and fair flow the streams. The gentle deer grazes, the wild blossom gleams. From ocean wave raging to mountain serene. All nature's proclaiming our land's evergreen. Welcome to Columbia Conversations. I'm Felix Bunnell, editor of Columbia Magazine for the Washington State Historical Society. On this episode, we head out into international waters with Rick James, author of Don't Never Tell Nobody Nothing Know How, the real story of West Coast rum running from Harbor Publishing of British Columbia. He hums and haws, well, yeah, I I don't know. He um, says, well, how about, I don't know about that. Uh, how about something on rum running? And I, I remember hanging up the phone and being awfully ticked for a day or so. And then once I got involved with it, I just got sucked right in. I spoke with Rick James by phone from his home in Royston, B.C. Rick James, thanks for joining us for this episode of Columbia Conversations. We're excited to be publishing an excerpt in Columbia from Don't Never Tell Nobody Nothing Know How, the real story of West Coast rum running. It's, it's a fascinating topic, but before we get into the book, um, I know you've been doing research and writing and all sorts of stuff around a lot of maritime history in British Columbia for a long time. That's right. Uh, yeah, I've just uh, been the... Uh just fascinated with our West Coast maritime history, you know, um, and I started out, uh, oh, many years ago up here with our Victoria Times columnist back then. There was a Sunday magazine called The Islander, and I try to make uh, two submissions, you know, of shipwrecks or maritime stories, history stories here along B.C. coast, and uh, make them, and then I got hooked up with... uh, our magazine up here uh, called uh, it was West Coast Mariner at the time, but it's called Western Mariner. So I've become what they call a stringer with them for, oh God, going on 30 years. Yeah, but I just I just love it, you know. Um, you know, uh, many of us that live along this coast. I I renamed it. I I feel like I've uh, uh, fulfilled all long ago filled out all the requirements as a real west coaster, but I call it real wet coaster up here. Yeah, yeah. And it's what what I love is that there's every time I turn around there's there's some shipwreck that I've never heard about before or there's some instance where either the Spanish or the British pulled into a, a harbor or a port or you know some part of the west coast of Vancouver Island or something or southeast Alaska or whatever that I've never heard about before. It's almost like there's this it's like a mine that keeps giving up these riches. The further, the more you dig, the more you find these veins of history that have one tangent or another that, you know, that, that have just loaded with context about you know, indigenous history, about the colonial history, all this stuff that just kind of swirls around um, inside my head and maybe inside your head too. Um, and the, this notion of the water connecting us in our, you know, here in the U.S., where I'm talking from, and you're in B.C. this morning, um, there's this interconnection about the water that's been there since the beginning of time, and the fact that there's an international border between our, you know, the state of Washington and the province of British Columbia is most of the time kind of somewhat immaterial to the big long arc of history, but it was really important to the, the history we're talking about in this book about, about rum running back in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, how did you first get interested in, in the topic of, of the, the trade that went back and forth over the border during Prohibition here in the U.S.? Well, it's, it's an interesting uh, how I got involved with it. Uh, what it is, um, I became fascinated with one particular shipwreck. That, uh, I'm affiliated with the Underwater Archaeological Society of British Columbia, and uh, I never <laughs> learned to, yet to learn how to dive. But I, they 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 roped me into doing research and writing for their reports and. One particular ship that I was to- I've been totally affixed to uh, about her story on is uh, the five masted auxiliary schooner Malahat. Now, you folks down there across the line built one heck of a lot of those during the First World War, and uh, we did a few up here. But the Malahat was one of those, and um, they, 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 they were, you know, big lumber schooners, big five-masted auxiliary lumber schooners. And, uh, of course, once the Great War, the World War I was over, then uh, all the, uh, you know, uh, 
steamships and motor ships returned from the north, you know, the Atlantic front, and uh, they were obsolete. Well, the days of sail came to an end, but uh, Malahat was at every trade she got became involved in. She was uh, incredibly successful. She made uh, something like four lumber voyages, which is quite a lot because usually, whether she was American, whether it was American flagged or Canadian flagged, once you know, once the war was over. They made maybe one voyage, and they, you know, they just no way could they compete with a motor ship or a steamship. But uh, she made four voyages or so, lumber voyages to Australia and the Southeast Asia, and then she got into rum running. It was probably one of the most successful mother ships out there on the water during the Prohibition years down there. Um, she became. Well, tag Queen of Rum Row after the fact, but uh, <laughs> one of the guys involved in the trade uh, after years later said, God, she was an old, uh, like a fallen apart ship by this time. She's Queen of Rum Running. I don't know about that, but yeah, she never got busted off the Farallons, say off the Bay Area, or, you know, and uh, it's, she steamed through though or, or sailed too <laughs> did not didn't sail much she was anchored all the time as a liquor emporium but she was really <laughs> successful and then we i was able to run down her wreck over here on the uh, powell river across the water from us here in courtney and she's on the bottom there and now she's an underwater heritage site so i thought what a great story so i approached my publisher herbert publishing i put it up to howard white over there I said, yeah, I've got to do this story. I've got to do this story on this. It'd be great. And he hums and haws. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, he says, well, how about, I don't know about that. Uh, how about something on rum running? And I, I remember hanging up the phone and being awfully ticked for a day or so. <laughs> then once I got involved with it, I just got sucked right in. It's just an incredible treasure I came across that I've tried to share with everybody. The real story, because it's all been tagged, uh, you know, the Volstead Act and the Prohibition era uh, down there in the States is, you know, all this nasty gunslinging and Al Capone and all this nastiness, you know, is all criminal activity. And then I started looking how we did so well up here in British Columbia. Hey, you folks down there, you helped revive our economy up here. Put a lot of people to work. <laughs> I think our, our tourists still do that sometimes in the summer, depending on the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar. But, but before we get too far into the, the rumoring story, tell me about the wreck of the Malahat. When did, when did she wreck? When, when did that happen? Well, you know, after the uh, all these ships were, you know, with the... Uh, the end of U.S. Prohibition, uh, late 1933, um, what, what are you going to do with all these ships that are involved in the trade? And, of course, she's a auxiliary lumber schooner. So there she was uh, sitting down in Seattle at the end of the trade. And uh, they brought her. What happened is, oh, sorry, no, I'm wrong about that. That's uh, wasn't that. She was brought back to Vancouver and... And uh, uh, she had, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, yeah, she was being held by the government for back wages. Uh, guys uh, that had served in her didn't get their back wages. And uh, so, But a gentleman here on the west coast of Vancouver Island named Gordon Gibson, who was really big here, got into logging and lumber mills here on our west coast. And uh, he was towing, he had... Uh, he had, you know, he, the best way to move him, you know, you know big first growth uh, timber around was uh, they finally got on to, you know, uh, tugs and barges. But Gordon Gibson looked at the Malahat there sitting there, and I think he paid about three grand for her at, at an auction. The government auctioned her off in North Vancouver, and uh, he put a bid in and he got her. He thought, I'm going to have the... Uh, First, very first self-powered, self-loading, self-unloading lumber barge. So he was just going to use her under sail, <laughs> loaded and just fill her with uh, big first growth uh, like spruce out of the uh, what we call Haida Gwaii today, but the Queen Charlotte Islands back then, and loaded her down. But her old skipper John Vosper, that was in on 
that made a few voyages rum running with her in the early 20s. He was captain of her, and it, it was her uh, engine, this her uh, couple of Bollander uh, diesel engines. Uh, uh, they they were just so it was just so underpowered. Can you imagine trying to operate a big five masted lumber schooner loaded down with first growth in the confined waters, and there's just not enough power there. It was too scary. And uh, John Vosper just left the ship. He said, I can't take this. This is too dangerous. So uh, Captain Gordon Gibson put her on the tow line, and he put her on the tow line, and she wrecked off of uh, on our outside coast of Vancouver Island, off Barkley Sound, and she was left derelict there inside El Bernie in that. And then finally they towed her over to Powell River to use uh, maybe number the folks down that way know of Powell River and its floating old ship breakwater. There's even some American concrete ships that were built especially for the Second World War. I think there's a couple of them still afloat over there. But when they got her over there to join the floating Hulk breakwater, uh, she was too beat up. You can imagine dropping big spruce logs into a wood ship. Uh, so they put her on the bottom, and there she is at the heritage site over in Powell River to this day. I'll be darned. Now, um, in, in, in reading, the, <clears throat> reading your book and reading the excerpt for, um, that we have in Columbia for this, this upcoming issue, the, uh, I, I was unaware before of the, how British Columbia, or maybe it was all of Canada, had experimented with prohibition as well and kind of given up on it by the time American prohibition came into place. So it really, really was sort of this, I mean, it's an overused cliche, but a perfect storm for BC to be able to take advantage of the legal situation and the, the supply and demand laws that apply to everything. And the way that worked out is just is pretty amazing, as you say, so you're helping revive the economy. I, I guess I was really surprised, or I mean, surprised is the wrong word, but the elaborate lengths to which these different organizations went, particularly, what was it called, consolidated uh, importers or exporters? Yeah. yeah. What were they called? Consolidated Exporters Corporation yeah. Limited, yeah. Uh, and the old Yale town of uh, downtown Vancouver was set up there. Tell me about that company, because I think it's it's again it's the elaborate nature of it, and just the fact that it could be transparent because it was you know nothing was illegal about what they were doing in Canada. Tell me about Consolidated. Oh, it was a, a, a it was a oh it was a, a really smart move with our distillers and brewers and uh, liquor, liquor buying agents, hotel liquor buying agents, because, you know, uh, Washington, D.C. was uh, always beating up on our, our federal government in Ottawa and saying, you danged well got to do something about the bloody flood of liquor coming across the border here. It's illegal down here. And uh, so there was uh, a liquor, liquor export uh, tax uh, you know, up here in Canada, you know, they put a tax on ex- li- exporting liquor. And so initially, back then, it was $3,000 to have a license. So if a brewer wanted to export, he had to get, you know, pay the $3,000 fee. But then uh, they all got together, a lot of these exporters and distillers in BC here, and uh, said, geez, what are we going to do about this? And they said, look, Let's form our own corporation and all get together. Oof. So all they all got together and uh, joined together and formed Consolidated Exporters Corporation Limited. It was a ten thousand dollar fee. They did uh, our federal government in Ottawa raised the liquor export license uh, from three thousand to ten thousand dollars. But when they all consolidated, all these brewers, the distillers, hey. It sure, you know, makes a heck of a lot cheaper for the whole lot of them. It's just divide it all up. And, uh, yeah, that's very clever. And, and the the communications part of the there's a there's the story that and this is in your book as well. The notion of what Roy Olmsted was doing here in Seattle, the famous Seattle police officer, sort of defrocked Seattle police officer, and you know, famous bootlegger who spent years at uh, McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary eventually, but. Um, and the uh, the story of, of Roy and his wife El- Elise broadcasting from their home in in Seattle and allegedly or purportedly or one of those words like that embedding some kinds of information for rum runners in the children's stories they were reading over the air on their very sort of early protozoic radio station. Where do you come down on that that being 
an urban myth or there being truth in that story about, about Elise Olmsted broadcasting children's stories that were, that were coded messages for rum runners? Oh, no, no. There was... Uh, 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 you have down there, everybody uh, down there in Washington State um, should be aware that a gentleman um, named Philip Metcalf um, worked up the, the biography of Royal Olmsted and uh, just a second here, I reach over to my library. It's a book called Whispering Wires, right? Yeah, this was a. He, I'm really uh, grateful to him having written this book, Whispering Wires, the tragic tale of an American bootlegger. It's the biography of uh, Roy Olmsted, and I uh, thought oh, that was just a treasure to come across. But the, but the biggest realization thing that the, the got me about my book was that he he was such a gentleman and he just, I mean there was violence out there but he, he, he abhorred it he didn't want he wanted to keep away as much as possible from violence out there and keep it all as above board as you could doing an illegal trade down there bootlegging in the around Seattle and environments and uh, but he had his equivalent he was a quite the gentleman he was very charming well known, uh, all down there in the around Seattle in the business uh, world. There, he was very charming and uh, yeah, 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 quite the gentleman. But we had the equivalent up here, the guy that took uh, over as uh, over the management of uh, Consolidated Exporters Limited Corporation Limited for the its final years, uh, which he, came, he got on. Uh, he was called, I think, managing supervisor, but he took, you know, he ran the whole, oversaw the whole business uh, operation, so to speak. And he was a decorated Royal Navy officer. And he came out here and he was like Roy Olmsted, tall, charming, very British, very uh, almost upper class voice, but easygoing, charming, sophisticated very intelligent and when he took over consolidated exporters things really took off this was when they needed somebody badly because in the mid-20s the United States Coast Guard finally got beefed up with lots of new uh, vessels um, increased manpower and things were getting pretty tough out there and rum rolled down off your coast and uh, things that, you know, a couple of major busts, some other ships off uh, the Bay Area, off the Farallone Islands and international waters. And uh, so they needed somebody to take over and get get it back on going again really good. Once he took over, things really did well up here. And you mentioned the, the rum row for the area between Washington and Canada. Can you help me place that on a chart where that would actually be, that at rum row? Um, basically, well... There was there was one that didn't get mentioned. It was, it was kind of a smaller one. Was the out off the entrance to Juan de Fuca Strait, um, where you know uh, Canadian fast boat or you know delivery boats were delivering uh, you know liquor up to uh, motherships sitting off the entrance in international waters. There, that, but that was just a small component because there was such an active small boat trade down here in Harrow Strait. The San Juan Islands, and uh, but so the big time trade, rum roll, rum roll, big time was off the Columbia Bar, you know, out in international waters, man, really big off the Farallon Islands, off of the Bay Area, and I think my smaller, you know, would have been mother ships might have gone down farther, say to San Diego, but then uh, once your nasty federal government there in Washington started getting really beating up on Ottawa again, they saying, you know, you can't, you know, having filling these motherships with liquor saying it's destined for Mexico or Colombia and we're in it ain't. You got to have it going to saying exactly where it is, but it's going to go to Mexico. It has to go to Mexico. It has to go to Colombia. You can't be loading it down and then getting uh, somebody down in a Mexican port, say, to sign off the papers that the, the, all the liquor had been landed when it hadn't. They gave me a nice check, you know, for, hey, just sign these papers saying that uh, it's loaded and delivered. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
but uh, the, the Americans caught on. Uh, you, you know, you caught on to that down there. So what they did is like they, Canada, Ottawa, our capital city here. Said, okay, okay. We're loading ships. They have to actually land their, you know, load wherever they're going. So what happened is they uh, consolidated exporters corporation uh, set up a deal with uh, Tahiti. Whether it actually ever unloaded the liquor there or not, <laughs> but what they did it once it was there, then the, then there was the uh, Tahitian schooners and uh, other uh, types of schooners would load there and then sail across to Ensenada, just south of Ensenada. Rum Row had to move the ship. When things got too tough and rough, thanks to your U.S. Coast Guard off California. Uh, we thought, okay, okay, we'll move down just south of the line there, and they moved to Ensenada. So the Tahitian schooners were picking up the, all this finest quality, uh, you know, bourbons and champagnes and rums, you know, that had been brought around from, uh, you know, Britain and Europe. And, you know, they'd all be landed in Tahiti and then uh, brought across to Ensenada. Yeah. Wow. And it, it's interesting to think about what must have happened to a lot of those guys who were busy in the rum running trade, you know, out of Canada in the 20s and early 30s, once prohibition ends, I mean, they have to find something else to do. I wonder, there was almost, was there sort of a, a post-depression, or excuse me, post-prohibition depression among uh, the maritime industry in BC in the early 30s after prohibition ended? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think things went on as good as possible. Now, what happens there is, I mean, you had some, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like that some big time mariners got involved in the trade in the early twenties, but a lot of the crews were all these young guys, right? And running around in boats and tugboats, you know, old tugboats or or fish packers or whatnot, but and uh, and or got jobs, you know, got working on uh, uh, the mother ships, that just sat out there for months on an end off the American coast, but they all got all this wonderful sea time, right? Yeah. So they were well suited to moving into the, say, the towing industry or back into fishing, commercial fishing up here. Yeah. So the yeah, and a lot of them moved into you know they were lot lot of you know at sea experience, and uh, so they moved into that. That's great. Uh, back, but but I, I think it just uh, I think. They did as best as they could, but then, you know, like in the 3030s happened. So I think, they, you know. Yeah, it's it's a great story. It's a great sort of this, you know, children of a common mother here in the Northwest, you know, U.S. and Canada, B.C. and Washington with our 49th parallel border and our long history of, you know, going back to, you know, 200, more than 200 years of exploration, of course, going back thousands of years with the indigenous. This is a great chapter in local history and this book that you've, that you've written, um, Don't Never Tell Nobody Nothing Know How, The Real Story of West Coast Rum Running, um, published by Harbor Publishing, which we're really excited at Columbia to be uh, working with Harbor. I don't think that we've published an excerpt from, from that organization before, so hopefully there's more stuff coming in the future. And um, appreciate you sharing your excerpt with us and appreciate you telling the story. And we've got much more in our uh, current issue of Columbia Magazine. Rick James, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you to Rick James for speaking with me for this episode of Columbia Conversations from the Washington State Historical Society. An excerpt from Rick's book, Don't Never Tell Nobody Nothing Know How, The Real Story of West Coast Rum Running from Harbor Publishing, is the cover story in the autumn 2019 edition of Columbia Magazine. For more information about Columbia Magazine or to subscribe, please visit WashingtonHistory.org. I'm Felix Bunnell.